But we have, uh, I'm going to go through and introduce everyone shortly. But first, we have Judy Selmans and uh, she's going to just set the scene for us. Thank you so much, Shane. Look, and I wanted to give my personal thanks to you all for joining us today. My idea when I came up with this format was to give small businesses some inspiration, to get your creative minds thinking about what you could do to change your world. I was driving around last week and all I could see were smaller businesses that were going to struggle in our new environment and at no fault of their own. And today that's a reality. And for many small businesses, innovation and thinking laterally is something we maybe hope to get to at some point and that's now been forced on us. While we can, can't solve all your problems today, we can guide you on cutting through that clutter looking at them from a fresh perspective and the new opportunities. And I think it's really exciting. That's where today's episode will be a starting place for your reinvention. You know, just over the last few episodes that, uh, that you've, you've actually released, uh, Judy, there's been some incredible uh, marketing ideas and concepts, but I don't think anything, I don't think, I don't think there's any generation that exists now, uh, even those who went through the war, um, can actually prepare us for what we're going through now because this is the most unique thing that, that any of us have ever seen. And yeah, so everyone... Absolutely. Yeah, going- it was interesting because I was talking to my mother, of course, and she went through the London Blitz and very familiar with it, but this has totally thrown her. So, yeah, so we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves for going, I feel a bit... It's a bit hard and it's a bit overwhelming and I... And I think we need to deal with that emotion, but then we can also look towards some exciting opportunities. And that's what really this is all about. And, uh, and I do believe that there are some exciting opportunities. It's going to take time for us to adjust. And I think in some ways, the first couple of weeks might be just an all adjustment and working out what that new norm is for you. And then you can move forward. So we deal with that and move forward. But at the same time, the idea here is to have that bit of inspiration so that you can go, okay, not all is lost. Um, you know, there, there are things we can do. So I'm really looking forward to everybody today and their inputs. I've um, known all of you or have interviewed you at times. So I've got a bit of an idea of what skills you'll be able to bring to this. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it because I know all of you are genuinely positive people. You're all ideas people. And uh, that's what we need in our world. It totally is. And uh, um, every one of you guys are um, just listening to the previous episodes has, you know, have some amazing input here. And, uh, and I think that we're going to come up with some incredible ideas today as to how we can, as to how we can combat uh, the, the uh, current situation and how we can actually make the most of this and turn it into something that uh, is amazing. And the very first thing is that we're all doing a podcast here right now. And obviously, podcasting has become the the, the new thing that we that uh, everybody's turning to, and the numbers are increasing rapidly. So, um, and they probably will even more now. Oh, absolutely! <laughs> the last two months, we've there's been an extra an extra two million um, people that have that have tuned in that have never tuned in before. So, you know, it's 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 growing rapidly, and and here we are at the cutting edge of it. So, I'm going to introduce each one of you. Um, and first of all, uh, we've had a couple of people say they want to be last. I think Jeff said he wants to be last. So we'll, we'll, we'll introduce Jeff, Jeff very last. So firstly, uh, let's have a chat with Wade Kingsley. He's from the Ideas Business in, uh, in Melbourne. And so Wade, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you think that you can help us today. Thanks, Shane. And, and thanks, Judy and Eric's for the opportunity because... Um, I always wanted to use a branded bunker for some purpose, and that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> here I am, in my little home studio as well. And I think that's one of the things that the common conversation I've been having with people this week is the adaptability, how you adapt. Um, we're, we're thinking about it from our own business perspective, but also we're thinking about it for others. And you know, un- unfortunately, it does sometimes take these dark times for humans to do perhaps what we put on the planet to do anyway, which is to collaborate and help each other succeed. Um, and it's just interesting to, I think, even in the perspective of everything that's potentially going uh, wrong in your business at the moment or is challenging in your business or feels different in your business, 
Um, one of the things that's helped me personally this week, and hopefully I can convey that today, is to have some gratitude because there is someone who is personally going to be worse off than you are on the planet at the moment, health-wise. Um, there's going to be someone in business who is financially worse off than you are. And even in those times, it's, it's, I think it's helpful to ground yourself uh, in the reality that um, human ingenuity and creativity is a way through these sort of challenges. So hopefully today I can help bring some perspective on uh, how to self-start creativity because I think that's often the challenge, particularly when you work remotely, is to think normally that viable bounce that you get from working in person with others uh, is a bit more natural. How can you start that? Um, process of trying to get your mindset right for creative solutions or creative development when you're potentially more physically remote, um, um, you're more socially distant. Um, I've certainly been accused of being emotionally distant before, but this time I'm socially distant. Um, and so I think there's some opportunity to try and think about using the distance to advantage to see things that you might not have seen otherwise. So hopefully I can help along those lines today. Thanks, Wade. Uh, interesting that you, uh, you said talking about the home studio and here we are you know, so much distance between us, yet we're all sitting in the same studio here in, in, in Zoom world. Exactly. It's business now. Absolutely. It's kind of one of those forced necessities, but isn't it brilliant that sometimes these, these crises can um, open up the opportunity that we might not have explored otherwise. So it's great. Absolutely. Uh, so let's have a chat with uh, Jancine Francisco. Uh, she's from Bridgepoint Effect in Toronto, Canada. So we'll get the lowdown of what's happening in, uh, in, on the other side of the world in Canada. How are you, Jensen? I am Jen, good. I think we're a couple of, couple of days or maybe a week ahead of Australia and New Zealand and some of the changes that they're enforcing on, on people. Um, I've certainly noticed a very big difference this week over last week, which was our first week at home. Um, and I've had lots of opportunity to talk to colleagues of ours who work around the world. And it's almost nice to be able to tap in with people and go, okay, like, what's it like in work three? <laughs> what are you noticing? What's going on? So I think uh, this has certainly created an opportunity for many of us to be uh, connected in a way that perhaps we didn't think that we would be. Um, I think, you know, from, from the places that I'm looking at these days, what I'm, what I'm noticing is that, you know, with everybody kind of sent home and this whole idea of let's, let's try to figure out how we're going to keep our small or medium or large size businesses running. And I, you know, in Canada, many of the businesses are small and medium enterprises and they have less than 10 employees in them. Uh, as Judy said, it's not something, you know, they're innovative by nature, but they don't necessarily have innovative programs or innovation programs like some of the larger companies. And I think right now they're, they're being thrown into a situation where they need to uh, really deal with some challenges that, uh, you know, nobody could have planned for. You know, I, I was thinking about this today and, and, and in essence, our governments have put us out of business. <laughs> You know, and there's some irony in that, right? Like we have governments that are really working hard to, to support small business and make incubators and do all kinds of stuff. And they've kind of put us out of business or they've really made it challenging to continue. And I think that's really pulling on people's, um, pulling on people's creativity and trying to help them find. So, you know, a large part of the work we do is, helping people come, helping teams come together, helping leaders understand that the pressures they're facing aren't things that they're supposed to be doing on their own, right? When we have big challenges to face, I think there's a lot of pressure on leaders to feel that they are the ones that are supposed to have all the answers. And nobody has the answers to this right now. And I think this is the time where we need to find ways to come together with our people, even if it's stretched out uh, across you know time zones or distance and and we're in all kinds of different rooms to do it i think there's an opportunity to bring our people together and and be really honest with them about the challenges that we're facing and and look to them to help us find the answers to to these very very tough questions that we we all need to do uh or we all need to be dealing with and i think um you know, I'm quite used to dealing with ambiguity and, and, and uncertainty. 
uh, in the work that we do with our clients. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time helping people understand that. I think I've trained myself well in it. <laughs> and, you know, there's still days where, you know, we're all gulping and we're going, whoa, what is this? Um, but I do think it comes down to how are we managing ourselves? How are we managing our mindset? Uh, what are the sorts of things that we can look at? What are, what are we focusing on? You know, so much of what we're going to be able to do is about, you know, what are we focusing on and, and what do we want to find? Um, so that's the sort of stuff that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. No, thank you, Janice. So, um, you know, the, you, what you said about um, small businesses surviving, uh, it doesn't matter if you're small or medium or large now. I think we're all in the same boat and that's the uniqueness of this situation. You know, the, this morning it was announced that uh, I think 80% of the workforce at the Star Casino and on the Gold Coast is, is gone, finished. They've all been terminated. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought that we would come to something like this within two, three weeks? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. we're all here. I don't know. I don't know what the numbers are in, uh, in your continent. We had 500,000 people apply for employment insurance in the first week. And yeah. we had a million people apply in this past week. Now we still haven't laid off any of our people and I really hope that we don't, you know, we don't have to do that. They've promised aid, but certainly not to the level that we all need. And I think business leaders are faced with some really difficult challenges around, you know, what is the business they sustain? Uh, you know, what are they going to bring out of the flames of this? You know, there's loads of opportunity out there and I see opportunity and I know we will get through this. It's, uh, it's just in the short term, it's going to be very painful, uh, very hard. There's going to be a lot of grief, a lot of pain, a lot of, I mean, that's the reality. If, if we're not really good at dealing with the emotion that we're dealing with, I think that's going to make it all the harder. I think we've got to be really honest about what we're feeling and we need to be uh, honest in our approach and how we're going to work it out. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. So let's have a, a quick chat to Jeff McDonald now. Uh, and Jeff, you're an ideas architect from Melbourne. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Uh, thanks, Shane. Um, I think the bottom line is the first thing I'd say is I'm actually shocked. You know, as much as I think I keep an eye on what's coming, there's no way in the world anybody predicted this. But also knowing that there were calls for the pandemic was coming, but um, I think the funniest thing I've heard was someone said, you know, it must be bad in Australia when they're cancelling sport. Um, and I think that's kind of how deep it's actually got. It's all these things that we thought would, oh, yeah, it'll come due and it'll just clear some of that or it'll cancel some of that, but it's actually wiped us all off from what we normally do. And um, it's very much for me, I work mostly as a, primarily as a business coach working with business experts to help them create ideas that they can share and make a difference with their clients with and there's certainly opportunities here around all that but I think the first thing is and I think the path has already been set here that we need to actually just ground ourselves and be emotionally aware of what's going on with ourselves because otherwise we're just going to make silly decisions and I think that's kind of the, the toilet paper panic is kind of people operating out of reactivity rather than actually just grounding themselves going, okay, here's where we're at. This is the new reality. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I need to do to manage myself. And sometimes that might be um, like today, I'm sitting on my parents' kitchen table <laughs> operating off my, my phone because all my usual things are gone. It's like and the real tragedy for us and our family is that my dad's just gone into care for his dementia. And, He's literally in there on his own and we can't go and see him. And he's definitely in a situation far worse than I am. And I think that's part of it, as someone hinted before, there's always going to be someone worse off. But a lot of this, if we don't deal with our emotions first, we've got nothing. And if you want to be creative or innovative, you actually got to clear or be comfortable with where you're at um, before you can move forward. And I think that's the first point I'd make for people. Um, and then as we talk, we'll explore some of these opportunities. And I think some of these will be um, devastating opportunities. Some people are just going to be wiped out. Um, some of us are just going to have to tweak. Um, but in the same way, we'll all recover and we'll move forward in some way. And if we can stay on that bigger picture of 
maybe it's three months, six months, maybe it's 12 months, maybe it's 18 months, we're going to recover and we're gonna have new opportunities along the way. At the moment, just be kind to yourself and um, we'll see what happens. Brilliant, thanks Jeff. So uh, we, before we go to uh, Jeffrey, who um, I think has some, uh, some building happening next door, are you okay for, to speak now? Or? We are, they've uh, <laughs> finished cutting up the concrete. <laughs> so, so Jeffrey Wade, you're from uh, Honorick in Brisbane. Uh, so mm. tell us a little bit about what you do and what, and, and what your thoughts are on, on, all, on all of this. Yeah, we, we work with medium to large corporates. Our, our theme is that you know, we, we help them. Our line is 21% improvement in your targeted KPI in 21 weeks. And, and, and we do that through, through moving their leadership to, to, a, to a different paradigm. And uh, if you will, so many organisations are superb at managing their financial assets. They're really good at managing their physical assets. And then they talk about their human assets and um, how can one put it kindly? Treat them like mushrooms. <laughs> and and, and, it, and it's about transitioning organisations to actually realising that their human assets are probably the most valuable thing that they've got. And if they can work with them well, they can get transformative outcomes. So listening to the others talk about the human dimension um, connected very deeply with me. Some of what we do is the study of human expertise, the modelling of experts and expertise and how people perform exceptionally are they resilient in, in times like this? And uh, I, w I was kind of resonant in thinking, yeah, one, one of the things that, that I find myself doing, I smiled when we started out and did a little bit of breathing to get ourselves into a useful place. But I'm someone who's modelled folks who can... So I've studied the structure of how, how people uh, maintain flow states. You know, these states of being in the zone, the optimum performance. Now, I can turn that on and leverage it frequently. But i got to tell you, there's about 10 times a day at the moment that I, I stop and go, I'm not in flow. <laughs> and, I, and I actually take a few deep breaths and say, get myself sorted and stop the panic again. It's, and I see that around me. It's, it's either I, I, I talk to clients and 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 friends and um there, there was one poignant story that that comes to mind uh, a friend was saying we've just spent two and a half years building this business we've got employees it's in a it's in a great spot and we're going to lose all of that because of the nature of our business is that we that we deal with consumers and we, we have a face to the public so we have to shut it all down and and the the really positive thing about that sad statement was she then followed it up and said, but when we can get going again in, um, you know, we don't know, a month, two months, five months, but when we can get going again, then we'll just start over and we'll build it all up from scratch. And it was, it was such a heartening thing to, to hear that, oh, yes, it, it's going to be a real problem, but we're not beaten. And we're already thinking of, all right, the future and how we'll recover and when we'll recover. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's this mix at the moment of folks who are, um, who are almost behaving like the, the preppers. You know, that, that, that uh, maybe a term that doesn't mean much to you, but in, in the US, uh, the, the, there are a group who are called the preppers, and these are the ones who've dug the bunker in the backyard and have got the five years of canned food. <laughs> And, and um, they're prepared for the end of the world. And, and there, there are those who are, who are behaving a little bit like the preppers, uh, disappearing into the, into the bunker. And, uh, um, and then there are those who are, who are saying, well, this too, we can survive. And they're, they're looking for opportunities. They're reinventing their business or they're partnering with with other organizations so that the two of them can bring solutions to people who are struggling with the consequences of commercial shutdown and uh, you know, physical distancing. Mm. It's, it's, it's quite bizarre really to see these totally opposing responses, or, or, you know, or, almost 100% different, mm. but with the same trigger. And, and it reminds me of something I read once, um, 
it was it was a guy who was visiting a city in the US and and he went to a dinner that evening and he said it was it was really interesting because it was it was one of those small regional cities quarter of a million people big manufacturing enterprise was the hub of commerce in that town uh, i think it employed about 80 percent of the people and, and there were a load of ancillary industries that were feeding um that were supply chain to this to this manufacturing entity and it, it was that time of year when the unions and and the uh, the owners of the business were negotiating uh the uh employment conditions and salary pay etc for the next for the next period they were doing their enterprise bargain and uh the bargaining had run on the rocks and the workers were on strike and the you know the company was entrenched and not moving their position the union was entrenched and so you know 80 percent of the town is sitting at home much like now and he, he sat at this dinner table with and, and found he had a, a real estate agent on his left and a real estate agent on his right. So he turns to the one on the left and says, so how are you doing? You know, and he gets the whole story about doom, gloom, and think the business may fail, having to let my workers go, you know, with, with everyone unemployed, there's, just, there's just, just no property shifting. And he turns with trepidation to the person on his right, expecting the same story, he said, how are you going in, in these circumstances? We're booming. I'm going to have to take on people. And he's, and he's in shock. He's like, am I talking to an alien here or someone who lives in this town? And the other real estate agent said, you know, it's how you think about it. Yeah. Right now things are tough because people are off work and, and they're not getting their money. But, you know, sometime in the next week or two weeks, this dispute is going to be resolved. They're going to get a pay rise. They're going to go back to work. They're going to want the bigger, better house. I'm out there marketing to them now saying, you know, when that happens, I'm ready to help you find the new house. And I've got a lot of people who are ready to upgrade. Yeah, that's a, that's a good story. That's a good story. Yeah. I, I, kinda, I'd, I'd end with saying, you know, if, if you read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, <laughs> um, remember what it says on the cover, yeah, don't panic. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I think, I think it's just preparation. Uh, like you said, you know, sure, the, the preppers over in America are preparing for the worst. And, you know, I've got my Mad Max outfit ready to go. I'm just wondering when it's an appropriate time to put it on. But, you know, yeah. we'll just see. So, um, and we, uh, we just might finish this little bit of an introduction by uh, throwing to uh, Eric's uh, Selmans, who is the, um, together with Judy, they have engaged for insights over in uh, sunny New Zealand. Uh, and so, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are. Eric. Thank you, Shane. I class myself really as a marketing and research and content consultant, a few different facets that I get involved in. My big passion is gathering insights from customers uh, into their real life and using that to drive uh, you know, idea generation, creative problem solving. Because in the end, as you said before, Janice, that the pressure is on leaders to think they can do it all themselves. You don't have to. You can actually use your customers because that's really underestimated as a way of working through things. We, we find in our work that people love being presented with a problem. You get a group of motivated customers together and tell them, okay, I'm trying to decide what to do here. They'll pitch in. Now, whatever means you use to do that, and obviously these days it's going to be online, but to have people help you through this, and that goes for your team as well, because I know with a lot of businesses, and I understand what the pressures now of whether you keep people or whether some people are going to have to go, but in some way separate to all of this, to have team and customers together working with you, give them issues, try things out with them, and so that you get to the other end of this in, in much better shape. And uh, so you've actually, because it will be amazing what people will tell you. And I think under these circumstances, when everyone's senses are 
really quite sharpened and heightened in, in, in this that I think we'll be able to get an even greater level of input from, from people to help you along. Yeah, I think that, that that's, that's really the key point, isn't it? Is that, um, you know, it, it really is that point now where, where we just have to really be um, mindful of everything that's happening uh, and, you know, all start working together in this and not, not, get, not get afraid when we're hearing about people, you know, having to shut down or, or, or let people off. I mean, this is a, a situation where we just have to adapt now, right? No, exactly. And it's, and I guess from a, if I put my research hat on, because I love social observation and understanding what's going on. Now, whether you do that purely by skimming online news media is one way, watching people around you and even over the, you know, the, the, the past week or so, um, observing and hearing about what how people are adapting it's those accumulated even tiny changes going on now actually give i think a lot of businesses some opportunities to look at you only need to look in your own social environment as much as you're able uh, but you know the, the the level of online interaction that's going to go on now and the way people will adapt to having birthday parties online. We were just talking about that the other day. There are massive changes going to happen. Now that is the immediate situation. But how does that play out, out the other side? Because things aren't just going to suddenly revert to, you know, March the 1st, we'll just go back to that date and ignore what's gone in between. No, it's going, the, 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 these things all have an impact because while we are creatures of habit, we are also quite adaptable and we come out the other end being different. And I think for a lot of businesses, being close to that and watching really closely what's going on in your circle will actually give you a lot of clues. And as I say, if you can bring your customers in on this, particularly the friendlies, your more active people, tell them what's going because people know. And you say to people, okay, let's get together every week, couple of weeks or so, and let's just chat about things like we're doing today. The people will come on board and they will give you really good observations on the way forward. Yeah, no, that's good. That's a good point. So, look, I, I think we might open up this discussion. Um, I did want to throw to uh, Jeff with a question uh, as well. His internet was coming and going before. So, um, I, I do want to bring up a, a question about, uh, you know, changing people's lives for the better. And, and I think this is a really probably a good one to start with. You know, if your business is shut, uh, or sorry, if your marketing or your, um, your, your marketing a product or a service that is all about changing people's lives for the better, then under these circumstances, under these extreme circumstances, what should a business be doing right now? And, and if you would like to, to answer that, Jeff. Hang on, you're muted. I'll just unmute you here. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> Woohoo, now I'm ready. <laughs> um, I, I think um, Eric's is on the right path. I think the opportunity is to go back to the people you work with, you, the people you service, the customers, the clients, and actually just find out where they're at. Um, there will be some new opportunities there. There will be some new insights there. And what you provided last week might not be relevant to them anymore. So, for instance, I just put together an, an e-book about working from home, which I haven't talked about that for 20 years. That was my first book 20 <laughs> years ago. And, and I, but, but what I found was people were going, how do I work from home? And I had people asking me about that. So, oh, okay, I can help them with that. And I think that is the opportunity where... I'd like to think most innovation, well, there's different types of innovation, but that's a real opportunity for innovation to just go back and not even from the point of view of trying to design something that's going to work down the track, just kind of go back and see how you can help people in the short term. See what comes of that. I mean, it might be that you simply keep people afloat for a little while. It might be that they actually become customers for you, or it might just be this short term thing that you help people out and then get, you get back to whatever your core business is. So I'd be going back to your customers and keeping those com communication channels open and just hearing 
and supporting and listening for what people need right now. One of the things, though, uh, Jeff, I've, I've noticed is that uh, there seems to be a flurry of people, especially, uh, you know, in the, in the coaching world of, you know, I, because of the, the, the whole COVID-19, uh, I'm actually going to be doing this, uh, this masterclass or, or seminar for free. I mean, should we be going to that extreme? Um, yes and no. Um, I'm aware that if I'm losing my customers and my clients, it's likely that other people are in the same boat. So it might be a case of pay what you need rather than nothing. So some can afford to, some will be happy to pay. Um, others may not be able to afford them, but it doesn't mean you can't help them. So um, the old one of pay what you think it's worth or pay what you can or pay what you will um, might be a better approach. That's a nice idea. I like that. I like that. Now, we, we have a, uh, a guest that's arrived. Uh, should we be <laughs> yeah, invite, in, adding them in when they arrive so they can hear the conversation? So I think yes. he's just been added. So welcome, Phoebe, to the conversation. So uh, what I might uh, actually do is throw to uh, Wade. There's a question uh, which is, is very relevant and, uh, and also um, we might also get a, a few thoughts from Eric's on this as well uh, about the marketing, the communications industry uh, and the changes that have occurred and especially in light of uh, what's happened with radio in Australia uh, where all the radio stations are now, uh, all the announcers are now basically doing their show from home in their, in their respective homes. I mean, is this the future because of the pandemic? Is this what we have to do now with marketing and communications? Is it all just going to be at home? Well, I think what it will probably open up the opportunity to do is explore things that were potentially a, uh, an option before um, now as being more the norm. Um, you know, I think, one of the things, if I just switch out of media for a second, if you think about um, retail, think about, say, grocery shopping. Um, online shopping has been an option for grocery shopping for some time now, and a, a certain percentage of the population have utilised it. What's happened is, because of this pandemic, people are now utilising that service um, more seen to be as a necessity. Um, so they are now more adaptive in and the barrier has dropped. The technology was the problem. People not necessarily wanting to do their grocery shopping online, um, being either afraid of the technology or not trusting it or preferring a physical experience. Um, and what's happened now is that when we come out of this, people aren't necessarily going to be buying more food, but the way they buy it will be different. And um, because that barrier sort of has been dropped. So I think in the media sense, that the, the ability to broadcast from remote locations has been a part of radio for 30, 40, 50 years, really. It's just the technology has made it a little bit more accessible. You don't have to take a, a large truck full of broadcast equipment anymore. You can, a lot of shows that I'm seeing at the moment around the world are broadcasting from their phones. So the technology has been right? Sorry, what was that? They're essentially podcasting now. Yeah, well, they're essentially being remote, being, you know, being mobile. They're not studio bound. And I think the one thing that you can be guaranteed of is that um, uh, there were certain shows, you know, for a long period of time that weren't broadcast from the same studio or different locations. And, and I think perhaps radio will, if we're talking specifically about radio, will, will realise that their big strength is their mobility and their ability to be where the audience is. And um, it's not just about being out in, in branded vehicles handing out cans of Coke. It's actually about connecting people, connecting with people in the audience in a real way, being where they are, doing what they do, um, providing new entertainment experiences because of that. Um, so, no, I, I think from, from a, from a um, production perspective in media, I think that's, that's certainly going to be something that gets used a lot more. I think the bigger challenge for media is obviously the, the commercialisation and the monetization aspect um, where they are having challenges uh, around a, a pretty strong set of um, uh, advertising revenue just sort of almost evaporating uh, pretty quickly because obviously media feels the pinch pretty quickly when the market moves and it will be how they rebound out of that. What new ideas can they do to bring brands and clients more into the fabric of their uh, content? What can they be doing using the technology to remote to be in locations where the, the brands and products are to help make that connection with the, the audience directly? Um, they're probably the, the more immediate challenges they'll have to have a think about. Is it more about uh, uh, re 
thinking who your core advertising advertisers are. And I guess this goes for all media now too. I mean, instead of relying on the, on the local car yards who obviously are going to be really struggling, that we should be looking more at things like the insurance companies, the lawyers, the, the doctors. I mean, should they be the ones that, 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 that the media should be focusing on for marketing and advertising? Well, I think with the media, and this is a very broad statement, so I, I won't be offended if anyone within the media disagrees with me here, but I think the media has been in a very insulated space for some time because they've relied heavily on two types of, of overall spend. One would be brand spend, so big brands putting brand campaigns on, on media. The other has been more tactical, and obviously the growth in tactical spend in the last decade or so has pretty much overtaken brand spend. But what they have to stop focusing on um, is chasing the money. What they have to start focus, focusing on is, is what everyone should be focused on at the moment, is being of value. Um, it's about being of value to people when they need you. Um, and I was in the US a couple of weeks ago um, and got out just in time, thank goodness, um, but was having a conversation with um, someone over there whose car had broken down um, and had a flat tyre. And he had a Mercedes, it was a nice car, and he went to the, the trunk of the car and there was a spare tyre in the back. But the spare tyre wasn't inflated. And he had no means of inflating that where he was. So he had to end up calling the AAA or RACV equivalent. Um, and in that example, Mercedes' view of that customer was they, they were providing the service. They had a, a spare tyre in the boot. But the reality is they weren't of value when he needed them. He needed a tyre put on the car, not a spare tyre in the boot. And I think what's happened for so long is that everyone's been fixated on the market being so buoyant and so healthy. They haven't been of value. They are basically just monetizing what they can do. The sharpness has to come back to, for media, for other industries, for any industries now, is be of value when people need you and the price will follow. Don't be price obsessed, be value obsessed. Try and find a way to demonstrate that value. If you're advertising or branding products, um, the advantage you have at the moment is in ordinary times, it's harder to get a read on the market. You are kind of rely on multiple inputs and things change quickly. The advantage you have at the moment is the one thing we can predict about the market is it will come back. We don't know when, we don't know how hard will be hit, we don't know how, but we know it will bounce back. So what you can start thinking about is what products and services will be of value to people when it bounces back. Um, we know there'll be a lot of people out of work. How can we help people find work when the market bounces back? Uh, we know people- what if it takes ages who, to bounce back. What, what if it takes a year? If it takes a year, it takes a year. The, the when you've got to try and remove from the equation somewhat, um, you have to focus on um, more about what you can do. What's the, what's the value you can provide? Because the when is something that no one can predict. So it's pointless trying to draw up an exercise, I think, where you're going, well, if it's in three months' time or six months' time. And you might have to focus that more on immediate needs, such as cash flow and, and um, staff retention and stuff like that. But I think, you know, back to what Jeff was saying before about, you know, you've got to really just focus in on, on how you can help, what you can do. It's really important to know that you have a, a place or a role uh, where you can provide value for people. If you start thinking about the external things you can't control, you're going down the wrong rabbit hole. What can we do when the market bounces back? Because markets do go up and down. This is going to be a particularly bad down, but it will come up at some point. That, that's just modern economics. So get your mindset into how we can prepare. And for my own business, that's exactly what we've done. We, we had a strategic plan for two years um, that we literally had to kind of, you know, turn around um, and, and reverse on in, in three days last week. But what we've done is gone, okay, when the market bounces back, what things are still relevant, but how can we apply them when people are going to want us, when we can be of value to people? That's really important. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Thanks. Uh, Eric, what, what would you like to say about that? Yeah, look, I, I, that's a great point about providing the value because that's an emotional connection because so much of advertising and marketing and all sorts of media and over so many years has been pushing messages. It's like if we craft the right message and shout it loud enough and long enough and often enough, then the, the you know, people will uh, come and buy it. You know, you, uh, you can watch Mad Men, you can binge Mad Men on Netflix when, when you're locked away at the moment and while you're reminded of some great advertising practices from the past, there's also a lot that's progressed 
since then or should have. From my point of view, because I do work with radio stations a lot as part of what I do, what I'm feeling in this, even just in the last few days, the opportunities now for, for brands to appreciate that, that emotional connection, and I, I've been long a believer in that anyway, but it's not about pumping out messages, it's creating an emotional connection. Now, I guarantee that even if you're running really tightly right now, and you have a product or service that's generally of use to people, if you went to any media outlet now and said, I want to do something with you to entertain and to provide some kind of service to your audience, they'll jump at you because media and especially a live medium like radio, if I could make a pitch at this point, but to say that, they are in the business of making that connection of working out what's of value to people because the information they're having to disseminate now has to be of value. You can't tell people the wrong thing or add to the confusion, but also how do you entertain people, give them information against this backdrop of deep social disturbance because of the, 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 you know, it's not just jobs and businesses being lost, there are lives being lost in the, in, in, in the process. But in the commercial world, I think what, we'll come, what is starting now, what will come out the other end, is that that sense of value and purpose and emotional connection with people is going to last way beyond this. And that your form of marketing, and to think about how you work with your media partner, your advertising or marketing partner on creating that connection is really going to come through at the other end because people are not going to be in a mood to be hyped at the other end. I don't think that's going to happen. This is going to be a searing experience where people are going to look for who is sincere, who can I believe and trust, and that starts now. That's a that's a really that's a really good point. Look, I, I think that this whole um, process of of you know planning for the future is 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 brilliant, and we need to be doing that. But like you said, there's a lot of things that are slowing down right now. There's a lot of a lot of issues that people are going through. So, I guess I want to open this up to to everyone, and that is, how do we actually keep our businesses going? if people are slowing down their spend, I mean, it's, it's great to, to plan for the future, but how do we entice them to actually come and do business with us? I might just jump in quickly on that one, Shane, because I, I actually had an experience of this yesterday when I was working with someone um, who is in, in the event space. So if you think about, obviously, event businesses whose whole business is around putting on physical events, bringing people to them and monetizing it, and the conversation we were having was, he said, I don't, I don't know what business I'm in now. And so the exercise we went through with him was to try and really understand what value, again, that word comes up, value he provided. And what we got to was the fact that he wasn't actually in the events business. The, the business he was in was connecting people. And what he did really well was curated content and got speakers that connected with an audience and the audience would then hear the message. The way he used to deliver that, and we say used to now, used to deliver that was through physical events. So he had got himself into a mindset of like, well, I can't do what I've, what I've done for the past decade. It's like, no, you can. You still can create the connection. So why you do what you do um, hasn't changed. Um, what you do hasn't changed because you're actually making connections. It's the how you do it. So the quicker you can pivot to how you do what you do is the real change that's going on. Um, I think it's going to be much, much faster for you to come out for it if you can get your thinking into that space. Mm. Does someone else want to add? And if, if I may pick up from that, I think there's a really interesting thread here. And, you know, it really does come down to the value that we offer. And I think sometimes as business people, we don't necessarily appreciate, as, as your example there of your client, um, what it is we're doing. And I think 
I think in order to survive, many of us are going to have to let go of what we think our business should be or what we thought it was and recognize that that's not really what it is. What, what it is, is it's, um, you know, what's that vision? Uh, you know, as we showed in that example, what's the vision this person had for their business and what's the function or the purpose or the meaning? You know, what are they actually bringing to the marketplace? And when we can focus really on that and that broader perspective, we can let go of, but it's got to look like this and it's got to look like that. And, um, you know, look for different ways to be able to bring that to life. Um, I think the other thing that's going to happen or need to happen is that many of us are going to be called to challenge the assumptions that we hold about our businesses and what we're doing and even the value that we're bringing. I mean, Eric's had said, we're in a situation where, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, we are all going to be shut home out of our normal routine, uh, you know, doing things that we've not done for a long time, like worrying about, you know, is there food in the fridge where, you know, we could just go out and buy it as we needed it. Um, you know, so the longer we're in a situation where we're doing something differently, we're building new habits, right? And humans are creatures, you know, of habit. And so, if all of a sudden all of the beliefs we've held or the habits we've held are being challenged, then all of the things that we will do and we will find value in are going to challenge, be challenged too. So back to what you were saying about, you know, what's going on with your customers, what's going on. I think we would be foolhardy to think that we will be able to pick up in three weeks or three months or six months or whatever the time frame is exactly where we left off. Things will have changed. People's values will have changed and there's different things that they're going to want. So I think we need to be looking at, you know, what are those assumptions we have about, you know, I call it the who, what, where, when, why you, some of you are journalists, you'll appreciate this, the who, what, where, when, why, and how of, of why we're in business. Um, you know, and as we start to look at, you know, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? I think the other thing we have to appreciate is what have we already done? What have we built on? Um, what have we learned? What are the things that we can uh, pivot or turn, you know, to use those terms? Where can we take those things? Um, and are we willing to look at that through new eyes and go, you know what? Yeah, I did work really hard getting it to this point. And it feels like somebody's pulled the rug out from underneath me. But here's the pieces. And what if I just rearrange those pieces differently? And we do something else with it. And what if I keep open to the opportunity? What if I'm able to just let go of that's what it should be? And I can just start to focus on what it could be or what might there be there. I think that's when more things start to come with us. And that's when we can be much more resourceful. I think it's actually a really good uh, segue into, um, into this, uh, this question, uh, Janice, that you posed, uh, especially with what you just said then. What about the musicians and the, and the arts? I mean, we've had... Firstly, they've gone through the whole process of of getting their music devalued to to you know next to nothing because of of you know Apple and Spotify and all of that, and now they can't even do concerts. How are they going to make money? What can they do? Should they be thinking about make, making money at this time, or is there something else they should be doing? Well, you know, it's funny. I've I, I had the opportunity to reflect on this today because. We had a really interesting thing kind of come through our national news and it, it made me step back and we've certainly been hearing a lot of it. I mean, again, we're a little further ahead of you uh, in our experience of this in Canada. And, you know, there was a lot of news coverage about, you know, these musicians, they can't play, they can't get together, they're losing their revenue stream. Well, everybody's losing their revenue stream yet. Um, the reality is we all have access to technologies that we didn't have before, right? And I think the whole thing about uh, these kinds of shocks to the economy and to our collective consciousness is that it makes us step back and go, so why are we buying into that 
model, right? If you look at business models, right? So yeah, um, Apple came along and introduced streamed music and then all kinds of things happened. Well, we've been using a model of entertainment that says we have to go to big arenas or we have to go to big venues and we have to buy tickets and we have to show up and then somebody's going to resell the tickets at a ridiculous price because i love this uh artist well why can't the artist just broadcast on their own we're doing podcasts you know and and i look at this and i go no there has to be something different so um, I hope you can send out this link uh, at the end. It made me cry today. There's not a lot of times people can make me cry, but this is, this is I think, the beauty of what we can do. So Toronto Symphony Orchestra, everybody gets sent home. And like any arts organization, they rely on people showing up and paying money. And they, in Canada, we have a lot of grant systems where these people are supported also uh, through cultural grants. Well, this one bassist didn't like the fact that he was grieving uh, the loss of connection between his um, colleagues. And he went, what can I do about that? How do I connect? How do we play music? How do we perform when everything's been taken away from us? And he was inspired to learn a new piece of software and figure out how to do things. Now, I think I've seen a few other orchestras who are starting, so they all must be talking to each other. Um, but he basically created a situation where they chose a piece of music. Everybody played in their home studio. They all recorded themselves. They recorded their piece of the music. And he figured out with this software how to put it together. Well, I watched this thing today. <laughs> and... Uh, it was better than being at a live concert in the front row it's because i it's it's just like i saw them in their home i saw their passion i saw them with their music you know and it and it was choreographed whereas each artist came in to play his or her piece they were brought in and as the two trumpets were playing we saw the two trumpets but we didn't see anybody else and you know it was like wow I'd pay money to see that. I got it for free on YouTube today, but I'd pay money to see that. And that brought me a lot of joy. And that's something that didn't, I didn't have to go outside of my house to do. And then I could share with other people. And, you know, I shared it in my own network, you know, from a sim simply a story of, look, we are all going to be ch uh, charged with finding new ways of doing things. And, uh, you know, where we used to think that we couldn't do this, well, all of a sudden, everybody's running virtual meetings and doing all kinds of stuff, right? We don't need training on it. We're just going to figure it out. And, you know, yeah, maybe we need to hire an expert to make it better and do a few other things. But gosh darn, we can, you know, we can hum a few bars and fake it and figure it out for a while. Um, you know, now this guy talked about the fact it took him 48 hours to do this and all kinds of other things. But, you know, in contrast, think about how long does it take to load a band onto an 18 wheeler how many time how long does it take to travel from place to place how long does it take to set up and dismantle a stage you know what if we just did that in a different way and i think that's the challenge or the opportunity in technology there's a lot of concern you know that we've had about oh my god what's happening to tech maybe this is going in the wrong direction you know as we look at the way that tech can go but what if we took the tech and the advances we've had and we found a different way to use it. So that rather than being dispersed and, and not connected, we found a way to better connect. And, and really what I'm seeing over the last while is more of that heart connection, more of that authenticity, more of that humanity around, this is who I am. I'm, I, I wanna play music, I'm a musician. I'm meant to play music and I wanna just do that. And each one of us has an instrument we can play. It might not be something that we you know has a read and we put into our mouth, but each one of us has an instrument we can play and we need to figure out what that is and we need to figure out how to use the, use the, the tools and the technology that's available to us and to connect with the people around us to make that happen. That's a great example. It, yeah. Love it. Yeah. I think the key principle that we're operating or the fundamental thing that's actually going on here is that our usual ways of connecting with people have been 
challenged or even cut off. And the opportunity now is to invent new ways to connect with people. And I think those examples from Genesis are spot on. And the technology has been sitting there. Like I started writing about the work from home stuff 25 years ago. And I was really excited about the opportunities of what happens if people stay home in their local communities and what happens when people stay home for their families. And instead of just passing them as ships in the night when they come home or whatever, there's actually room to actually work in new ways. And I think this is the key to look at how do we actually want to connect with people? Oops, bouncing up and down. Um, how do we want to connect with people? And then what are the tools that we've got available to us that let us do that in new ways? And I think there's some great opportunities right now to use the technology that's been around us for 10 or 20 years, like Zoom or Skype, if you want to go back there, or even video if you want to, but um, there's ways to connect with people. So if we look at that as the principle, how am I now connecting with people? That's where our opportunities are going to show up from. Is it fair to say that the general learning from this is while previously you might not try something because obviously there might be risks involved and you might look silly or whatever, I get a sense here of this being a time saying, well, we'll just try this out. We'll just give this a go because what is there to lose now if, if you try something out that previously wild ideas that may have come up in the businesses meeting, you have your staff meetings and so on, and you, know, you might have your ideas sessions, something might be put on the shelf to say, oh, look, well, yeah, look, that sounds a bit out there. This is actually a time for being out there, trying things and, and see what happens because it feels like it could be really surprising what you get back. Yeah, and I guess there hasn't been a burning platform, Eric. So there's been, there's been the tech, there's been the knowledge. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really interesting what Jeff said there about it's been around for a while, but the, the need to do it hasn't been there. Now the need's arrived and out the back of this, we'll hopefully see people um, perhaps better embracing opportunities and technology because it's not as scary. You can, you can do it. We're all in different countries, different continents, different time zones, having a really productive and interesting conversation. Um, one of the things I keep seeing people say at the, this week is, um, oh, so maybe we didn't need all those meetings after all. <laughs> Perhaps productivity gains can come from people who aren't just having that Monday morning regular meeting that goes for an hour where people just talk around in circles because we have to. Uh, people might get a greater sense of productivity over this time because they're realising that when you're limited in your resource or your opportunity, it forces you to adapt and you, you come out better for it. I want to chime in a bit myself. Sorry to interrupt whoever that was. But just to say that I also think there's an opportunity not to just connect with your team but with customers. And I see huge opportunity for small businesses in this period when maybe they can't actually physically connect with customers, but to do it online, to, do, to give them an opportunity to get involved in another way. And that makes them feel part of that brand and it's building a trust element that, that you know, because we're pretty much untrusting of a lot of stuff that's going on. There are some governments that aren't doing so well with this whole process and some that are doing better. And... So I think there's an opportunity there for small business to embrace that as well. And I, get off the email. Yeah, totally. I think there's a, there's a, um, I've had a couple of discussions with, with some business owners and also some um, um, musicians as well over the last uh, week. And a lot of them are forgetting about the fact that, that, this is a perfect opportunity for them to really cement their customer base, to cement their fan base. Uh, and especially by creating something like even something as simple as creating a Facebook group, you know, and building those, building those numbers because it allows them to interact. So is this a time that we've basically been forced to sit back and really consolidate everything we're doing and, and actually have a bit of an, an, an inward reflection on how our business is going? I, you know, if I can chime in, I really think so. I think, um, you know, going back to the conversation, right? This is a podcast about innovation and innovation is all about value. And 
when you're in a in a time where it becomes challenging to do things as you used to do right if you're concerned about where where your next cash flow piece is coming and you're worried about you know what are you doing with your employees um i think we have to be questioning everything that we're doing and and then i think we also have to be asking how are we making that connection with our customers and what what are what can we do in a time where maybe they are not in a position to give us bandwidth or purchase or do the things that we would normally need them to do uh, if they can't do it because they're just not allowed to come into our storefront if that's what we're dealing with then we can't ship it to them because maybe we have some issues in in doing that i think the really important thing is to get creative around how do we connect to them and tapping into what is it that they need at that particular time? What is it that we can offer? Um, you know, how can we do? I mean, last week, you know, you guys are okay. Wait, watch me. I tell you, you know, you're going to get a crap load of emails saying, oh, because of COVID-19, we've all gone home. It's like, you know what? Crap, forget it. We all know you went home. Like, you know, we're not living in, in a mushroom patch. Um, you know, thank you for telling me that you're out there. And I, I kept getting, you know, one of these after the other. And, and they were all corporate communications. You know, we're doing everything to be safe and we're still here for you. Okay, yeah, I know you are. Like, you're a business person. What else can you tell me? And I, I just kept watching this and it's like, I really want to reach out to my customers. And we were about to send out a newsletter, right? And I kind of went, I am not sending out something that everybody else's son sent. Like, come on, I'm in the innovation business. What can I do? And I just paid attention to what I was noticing. And I ended up partnering up with somebody else. And we decided that, you know, where people are in a place where they just need a way to get themselves grounded and, and kind of look at, you know, what are the things? And so what can we offer people? Well, we can offer people a way to look at how do they need to be positive and how do they need to be creative and what do they need to do to take care of their immune system at this time when they're terribly stressed and, and take care of their mind so that they can actually make good decisions and do things. Now, were we planning to do this? No. Was I planning to partner with this woman to do it? No. But it was a perfect thing to do because it just made sense. Well, we've been inundated with the response. And what I think was better was that people actually reached out the day that we sent out that email and said, thank you. I couldn't dare, I couldn't handle another one of those emails. You're actually giving us something of value. Now, hey, we got lucky, right? We, you know, I don't know if the next time we do that, it'll be right. But the point is, I think we have to constantly reevaluate and, and go, does this make sense right now? And tap into our intuition and get out of our heads mm -hmm. and, and connect with our heart and look at what do people want? People are really vulnerable right now. So how do we connect with that vulnerability and how do we help them in a positive way? And, you know, my belief is if that's the sort of value we can offer, you know, what else are we going to do? Nobody, you know, like, let's just give them some value and and do something authentically so that down the road when things start to shift who knows where who they'll call or what they'll do but you know business is about building relationships and it's about being there for your customer even when they're not buying it's it's about connecting with them and recognizing that they're people and they've got families and there's things they've got to worry about. And it's not just, you know, when the next contract or check is coming in, it's a whole bunch of other stuff that we have to be concerned about. Yeah. Would it be fair to say, Janice, that even the smallest thing you can do for someone will actually have a big impact in, in this environment? And commercially, yes, will be of a longer term benefit, but that's, you know, there, there are, great altruistic reasons for, for, for doing it, obviously, but feels like just even a small thing, as you said, reaching out in some way to a customer will have great benefit to, to, to everyone concerned. Well, and can I just add to that, Eric, before you answer, Janice, is that sometimes that means not doing something. Um, right. I also have been in the position like Janice where every product 
or business I've bought in the last three years has sent me an email in the last week telling me their response to the coronavirus. I don't need to know. I don't want to know. That is, you're clogging my inbox. So same example, yeah. Janice. But to add to Eric's question, it, can it also, Janice, be sometimes where doing nothing or acknowledging that you're not causing them more problem or pain is actually what they need right now? You know, I, I think so. I mean, I think the... I think the, you know, the game has changed, right? And and we all went to business school, or at least I did, and then I went to creativity school, and I did a whole bunch of other stuff. But the reality is, you know, we have to respond to what's happening. These are human beings. This is not, it's not a revenue stream. It's not, you know, this or that. There's a person on the other end, and they have needs. And that's really what what business is about it's it's the value that the way that we help people fulfill their needs whatever those are and sometimes there's a lot of power in not saying anything sometimes there's power you know again if you want to look at how do you get creative maybe all you say is hey anybody feeling like this <laughs> like, like, you know like well, yeah. like you know i'm sitting there and it's like okay i had a day last week where i pivoted 18 times but man it was a fantastic day but it was just like you know like whoa right and then you know the next day was a little more somber and right so you're riding this wave of emotions and you know we're going to come out with corporate speak and and pat emails and it's like who gives a crap like maybe, maybe you could that? send an email out asking has anybody got a new pasta recipe Please, I need to do something different. Uh, well, look, I, well, I, I, I something out, something different like that uh, is just communicating on a human level. Yeah, just just throw all the other stuff out. Yeah, be real. Just be yeah. real. About it. Yeah. Well, you know, I've even noticed a big shift in uh, the sorts of things that are coming in. Uh, through LinkedIn. I mean, you know, I'm sure we, we all use LinkedIn, yes. right? And, you know, I either have people who feel they can help me find lead generation and it's all business speak, <laughs> right? It's like, really? Okay, um, thanks. No, I don't want to be in your network. And then I have, you know, executives, you know, who, who, who are in, you know, different sites, companies or small, medium firms, founders or whatever, reaching out and just going like, hey, right? And, I hope you're well and you know, how you doing? And then it's like, well, you know what? I don't do a hell of a lot of personal sharing regularly, but hey, the world has changed. It's like, you know, and, and dude has just told me that he's at home with three kids and he's trying to still do his job. And it's like, well, you know what? I, I can relate to that. And I live at home and here's the thing. That's tough what you're doing, but boy, what an opportunity. Because you have somebody to hug at the end of the night, and there's nobody to hug me here, right? So I got to find a different way to get it. And it's just, it's like, we all have something that we're dealing with, and there's a good in something that we're all dealing with, right? Um, and so I think we just have to acknowledge where each other is and, and get past that fact that there's this facade that we have to keep holding up. It's just, we're people. We all are having an experience. We are all having the same experience. Some of us are going through it, you know, two weeks or three weeks or a month before the others. Um, and there's something we can all learn from each other in that process. And I think what I hope is we'll all learn how to be more human and we'll learn how to be better connected. I think that's great. I think we all should be giving Janice a virtual hug right now. So <laughs> that's it. Oh, if you could only see on the podcast what I'm seeing right now. There's a lot of love in this uh, in this Zoom room. So I want to throw to Jeffrey Wade, who we haven't heard from for a little while yet, and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, in light of this whole conversation, uh, how do we? You, there was a question that was asked uh, that you, that you said that you'd like to sort of speak into, and that is, how do we manage continuity of our supply chain? You know, it's great that we've got all of this helping customers and and building our our customer base but what about the supply chain that we're losing fair enough yeah um actually i'll, I'll respond to a couple of things that have been said as well as that um 
Janice was talking about, hey, I'm stuck at home with uh, the, the three kids. It, it, some people seem to be getting through this with a great sense of humour. Uh, I, I saw a posting of uh, someone who was clearly working from from home, sitting in the office, and you know, the caption, the new, the new model of working from home. Lying on the floor behind her were her three kids, and they were tied up with rope and gagged and bound. <laughs> yeah. so it's, 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 you know, people are managing to keep some sense of humour about this. And um, with the supply chain, I mean, I mean it, it's such a vast thing in terms of, you know, it's materials, labour. It's, uh, you know, I even include customers in, in, in that um, conversation. And I think partly the, the way to answer that question might be to share a story of one of the people in, in my network runs a business that is primarily face-to-face -face training. And so you, you, can, you can appreciate that for, for him, a huge sudden shift when we have a conversation about what he could do about that. And I connected him with some people in our mutual network and some people in, in my network, but essentially um, connected him with people who, who do social media marketing, connected him with, with people who translate classroom learning to online learning. And now he'd been making that journey anyway, but but he was seeing it as something that was a massive investment in the long time frame to transition to, to move all his material to, to online. They reached out to the customer base and came back with actually there's some subsets of what he does that the customer base really wants right now to help deal with the situation. The, the people that he, he talked with all basically planned together and, and the social media folks said, look, we'll do the marketing for you. The, the folks who are great at videoing and, and um, creating online learning said, we'll, we'll create the, the learning material for us. You provide the content, do the delivery. And now here's the kicker. Two things. They did this, they created these programs in four days. And they also agreed to run it as a joint venture. So it cost him nothing. Each person chucked in their stuff and they, they literally kicked it off on Monday this week. And they're, they're, they're selling stuff, they're earning revenue and they're splitting the revenue equally between the three parties. And it, it's, it's, it's an, I guess it's another example of yeah, what Janice was talking about earlier. She partnered up with someone and created something new out of the mess. I, I think my message to, to, to people about supply change is, okay, have a look at them, see which ones are the biggest risk. Yeah, um, you're going to have to manage that and possibly find alternatives. If, if, if you, you know, I think of another customer who's in the, you know, in the IT industry and a sizable chunk of the hardware they sell came from China and the wrong part of China, and they literally couldn't get kit for weeks. Um, that's changed for them and they're now able to ship. But yeah, if you're in that, in that scenario, you're going to be looking for other supplies and doing it fast. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to deliver. And then there's, then there's the lower risk stuff that you'll, you'll have your contingency plans for. But I would, I would also say to you, um, you know, apart from the risk management and looking for alternatives, I think your supply chain, as, as in the story that I just shared, your supply chain could well be your opportunity. And they, if you can partner with them in the right way and, and you're willing to share revenue, you, you can create something new that is vital and vibrant in this market right now. And, um, and you can make it happen very quickly and move forwards. Think about your supply chain in two ways. It's a risk. It's a massive opportunity. You know, I think the other aspect to that, um, is is this my bet is none of those people sat and had a conversation around what's the licensing agreement what's the this what's the that right and and i think that's the other thing you know from a supply chain and 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 from some of the ways that we're doing business you know i think we need to be very you know we still have to be careful about who we're getting into bed with so to speak yeah. Yet, if we're all in the boat and we're all going, I have this skill and I'm willing to give you this and I'm willing to give this, right? Yeah. There's value in that. 
there's value in that and that's enterprising and that's entrepreneurial and if and if we can just kind of focus on that aspect of it then exactly as you say new opportunities happen and and it goes back to letting go of what you thought it should be what you know there's a lot that's not good about the way the business systems and the things that we've set up traditionally i don't think they've really served us well and they certainly won't serve us well as we move into a new place where we're relying on technologies and needing to get very creative if money can't be exchanged well, what else can we put into it? We can put yeah. in energy and create something else, right? Yeah. So I think those that that sort of stuff is going to be very important, and and people are just going to have to let go of it has to be this way or that way. I don't know. Maybe if I was a lawyer, I'd be a little worried right now. Um, and you know, because yeah, but people are just going to figure out how to make things happen. Yeah, and your existing supply chain, you have a relationship with anyone so we were talking earlier about trust and, and how important that is there's a heap of trust there already one hopes and you know when, when you think about my story as i was saying i was putting people that i know like and trust together so if they didn't have a relationship already by proxy they knew that i was only going to connect them with people who i had a long-term commercial relationship with and i knew they could work something out so so yeah, maybe there's another element there. I suppose there's another message in there. Remember your network. Um, you know, it's funny you say that because that's the thing that I've certainly, I don't know, I'm curious about the others, but I certainly have been aware of my network in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think what I'm observing too is people are willing to go, I need help with, can you help me find someone? And again, I got to think of, think of a great, trust and capital you created because of what you just did with that right you you don't want to set up people who you don't trust right it's just yeah. hey guys here we go and, and also asking for help i mean you know we talk about before that people probably afraid to use technology that was already available to them well one of the things we've always been capable of as humans is asking for help but we often think we have to appear to be more successful than we are our, our social media presence has to give the impression we're doing really well. But the reality is, we're all, as you said, I think, Janice, we're all in the same boat. So it makes it easier, breaks down those sort of psychological barriers to ask people right now when you need help and, and support others who are giving help. I think that's another bit you can do mm. is look at the broader network and where you have suppliers, customers um, or, or other industries, even competitors who are doing great stuff at the moment. And, and being of value and helping people, support and applaud them. And it reminds me of the great example at the moment where supermarkets in Australia have an hour at the start of the day uh, for people who are elderly or have physical disabilities to do their shopping on their own. That's a great help and service that a supermarket is doing. We should applaud that. And also recognise that why, haven't, why hasn't that been thought of before? Why can't they keep doing that? Um, you know, that, that's a great testament to what kind of society we want to live in. So. I'm really loving at the moment how all the usual barriers are just completely crumbling away, uh, even though it's a time of crisis and a time of, of immense stress for a lot of people. But we're asking for help. That, that's a really big step forward. And can I make an observation about asking for help from a cognitive scientist or psychologist's perspective? When you ask for help, you build trust. Believe it or not, asking for help is a big trust builder. Um, so... So if you had some element of trust there to begin with, when you have the courage to ask for help when you really need it, you actually enrich and deepen and strengthen the trust that you have in your existing relationships. It's, it's, the, it's counterintuitive. We all think, oh, I'm asking for help. You know, it's, it's going to degrade the relationship. No way. It's the complete opposite. It deepens it. Because the, then the other party knows that when the time comes around, there's this other thing that Robert... Cialdini says in, in, in his re research that we create called reciprocal obligation. And they know that when they ask for help, will you step up and be there for them? Of course you will. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, look, I think uh, we've, we've come up with some really unique perspectives here today. And uh, we're, we're all facing, uh, you know, unusual challenges and, and uh, unusual circumstances. So, uh, I think there's been some really good themes that have come through here. 
I'd love to uh, wrap things up and, and just hear sort of a, a, a few final words from each of you uh, as to as to what we can actually be, be doing during this time to really uh, advance our business, help one another, whatever it is, but, but what do you feel is the most important message to take away from this? So who would like to start with that? Mm -hmm. to, Jeff, Jeff McDonald. Um, I think the key is connection. Go and talk to your people, go and talk to your family, go and talk to your team, go and talk to your customers, go and talk to your clients, go and talk to your suppliers. Find out actually what's going on for them because there's a good chance it's changed from last week. And that will be the chance to possibly cement the relationship. It may be to grow something. It may be to start something. It might be as simple as, I'm here. Can I help? In whatever way that might be. So I'd be looking to connect with people. I'd, I'd echo that. I'd... Yeah, you know, relationships are the foundation of business. People conduct business. And op opportunities don't float in the clouds. Opportunities are attached to people. And what Jeff's just said is talk to people. Man, oh man, yes, go do it. Deepen the relationship and guess what? You will connect with opportunities as well because they're attached to people. That's, that's awesome. I would just completely echo that from, again, with my research hat on and the concept of, of just staying close to people and that, you know, when I talk about research, you know, that's about relationships or should be in the end. And I, and I just passionately believe in that, that asking for help from your team and customers at a tough time, people will step up. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Um, mine would be that um, I think with sort of echoing all those thoughts in one of the things that came up in our conversation today was don't feel like you will have all the answers. Don't put that pressure on yourself. It, it is a time where communities are coming together in very different ways and, and some would say it's about time that they are. And I really love the fact that people like this are coming together, sharing expertise, sharing thoughts in different time zones and different countries and meeting for the first time, but putting something on the table that we can all take away from. And, and I think that, you know, I've learned as much about my business in this conversation as hopefully other people have as well. Um, so the benefits that you get when you put something on the table will come back to you. So don't feel like you have to have all the answers. Um, look for ways in which you can have conversations break down those normal barriers and and you know as jeff fantastically put around that the, the the reciprocation of those benefits will come down the line when you're actually asking for help and look i just to finalize for me i think i don't know if this is just my sense of humor but i i kind of like to try and find sometimes the light in the dark and i think that one thing that keeps coming up to me this week for some reason is a quote from the movie flying high <laughs> which might be known as airplane in other parts of the world. Um, and the quote is when, when the guy says, um, I picked a hell of a week to give up sniffing glue. And <laughs> it's just, you cannot, you cannot predict what is yet to come, um, but you can try and ride it out. And, and whatever that is for you, uh, whether that's enjoying music, enjoying being with your family, um, having a laugh where you can at things you can laugh at or indulging in your favourite TV show, make sure that's a big part of your balance. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I, love, I love that. You know, I think, um, yeah, a sense of humor when you're going through, right? One of the main, when you look at creativity and the skills you need in that, uh, having a sense of humor is one of them. You can't take it all too seriously. It, it really is important. Um, I think. I think it would be very easy and, and I'm human, you know, I'm not so sure I had a fantastic day as a part of yesterday, but today was a good day and the day before was a good day and tomorrow who knows what it'll be. Um, the reality is all we can do is live in the present moment and move through that and connect with ourselves. Um, you know, be very clear on the fact of where we want to go uh, and I, I think it's really important to have a vision for what it is we're trying to create. And maybe we have to also get really creative in that and, and rethink about that. Uh, 
you know, for myself many, many years ago when I decided I was going to go make a big change in my personal life. Um, you know, I did it without making, I didn't have a plan. It was like, Oh my God, I'm making this change and I don't have a plan. Well, guess what? Nobody had a plan for this, right? Nobody had a plan for this. And what I did at that time was I, I knew I needed to focus on something to allow myself to go. And I couldn't, picture what it was I right like right now there's so much ambiguity and uncertainty it's like okay what is my business what am I doing and what I needed to do is get really creative on what's my vision and at the time I was living a really complicated life and I was looking to build my business and scale it and do a bunch of other things and I realized that what I needed to do was my vision was I was creating a simple life if you look at the words for what a simple life is it's unconstrained it's, it's, it's just a life that's simple and it gives you so much movement and so much freedom. And maybe this is an opportunity for many of us to get really simple and get back down to some basics and look at that. I'm not saying everybody has to have my vision, but I think we all have to find what that vision is for us. And it's not going to be what we thought it was before. And when we connect to that, we got to keep moving forward. And when we move forward, even if it's a little step today, and even if it feels like we're stuck tomorrow, um, the point is we will keep moving forward and we better find the gratitude. There's awe, there's good stuff out there. And if we fail to keep focused on that, we will fail. You know, this is, we can thrive and there's different ways to do it. And this will be a real real call to action it'll be a call to emotion it'll be a call to keeping ourselves mentally stable and a whole bunch of other things we can do this and i think as we reach out into our networks and we ask for that help whether it's i need a guy who can do video and help me get my content converted in that great story or maybe it's just calling up one of your friends and going okay like i'm about to lose it like get get me off this ledge because i'm not going to manage it right now and, I, and you know what, I, we, we are all going through that. And I think we have to hear that and we have to help each other through it. Yeah, that's, cool. look. that's great. Look, um, thank you all for your, um, for your valuable input um, today. Before I throw to uh, Judy to uh, wrap it all up, uh, I'd just also like to, from a practical point of view to remind everyone, we're gonna be doing a lot more of these Zoom calls, Skype calls. I don't know whether anyone's seen the Facebook video that's getting around, but but if, you, if you're on video, please remember to turn the video off before you go to the toilet. It's a very big fail of a, of a lady who just, just forgot about that she was on video and she's sitting there going to the toilet and then suddenly realises and of course everybody just stopped what they were doing. So uh, look, if you get a chance to have a look at it, just remember this is um, a new era in technology now. So, <laughs> But um, just to wrap things up, um, Judy, if you'd like to... Uh, yeah, finish everything up. Yeah, look, I, I, firstly, I really want to thank everybody for, for taking the time out and, and uh, I know it's hard. And, and, and I guess what I really enjoyed about today was actually the raw emotion that everyone is sharing because this is, you know, you do feel it, it affects all of us so differently. And as someone pointed out that, you know, some of, you know, I've been thinking about those who have got kids at home and worrying about how they're going to school them and all of those sorts of complications. And then you might have a business as well. So I can't even begin to imagine. But I think as business owners, we have to remember that our customers are human, that our team are human, and that we all are feeling our own emotions around this time. So it's just important to remember that. And, and remain connected. I think the key thing I got out of all of this from everybody was that connectivity, let's, we've got the technology. You know, if this had happened, if this scenario today had happened 20, 30 years ago, quite honestly, we'd be all, you know, seriously, it would be a real challenge, but it didn't, it happened today. Um, we do have technology, we have the ability. I think this is going to bring and a level of emotional intelligence back to our businesses that has been severely missing. Uh, you know, 
there's been a lot of talk and all of you will have seen all the content on LinkedIn. There's everyone talks about, you know, EQ and yes, we love our customers and all the rest of it. Sorry for most of you, it's crap because I see so much that isn't remotely close to that. And this is an opportunity to take stock, an opportunity to go, we need to connect. We're isolated now. We need to bring that community back. And you can do that with team customers and think about your future. How can you reshape your business future to bring back that community? And that's what we're going to miss at first the most. And yes, Janice, you're a little more ahead of us in, in this isolation business in, uh, in New Zealand. We are in complete lockdown as of pretty much the, 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 our Prime Minister asked us to go into lockdown yesterday, but officially it's from midnight tonight. We, we can leave the house to go for a walk in our local area. We're not to get in a car and drive unless we are going shopping or we have a medical appointment and you have to actually prove that. Um, so we're fundamentally locked down. That is yet to happen in Australia. Uh, but the point is that, you know, we're all frightened as well. You know, where do you go? Who do you touch? You can't see. You don't, you don't know what's going on. And that, so that's a level of, of the, the trust, the security, everything in our world that we've known has disappeared overnight. So we have to accept that that's like it for everybody and think about your world and go, what can I do to make my small part of the world better for those that I work with? And if you can do that, and it came back to many conversations we've had in the last hour and a half or so on, on adding value. What is it that you can do that brings, makes their, look, in the end, if it doesn't make, add value to them or make their life better in some way, then don't do it. You know, and Janice, as you said, with all the emails, did it make my life better to get all those friggin' emails? No. Like you, I read the first couple and I thought, oh, that's interesting. No, it's no longer interesting. It's boring. And you're the same as everybody else. You've now torn, turned into wallpaper. For us to stand out in a business environment, we have to be different. We have to, you know, we have to be innovative. We can't just sit on doing what we did yesterday because it worked and everybody else does it. That's not going to wash it anymore. And, and it's possible. Get support where you can. And, you know, we're going to do that with the podcast. We've made a commitment that we're going to keep motivating people. And, you know, if anyone's got some ideas on topics they'd like to hear us or we'll make it happen for you because that's what we want to do. It's part of our contribution. Um, but we can do this. I think we can do this as a community. Um, and I think it was maybe Janice, you also mentioned that about getting back to grassroots and, you know, that sort of thing. I've, I've long believed that that's the thing and that might be my green credentials a little bit as well, that we will go back to some of those things. And that's important. So to think about that in your business and, yeah, make life people, for everyone better. It'll all be good. Awesome. What a, a great way to, to wrap it up. Thanks, Judy. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Eric's, Janice, Wade, Jeff and Jeffrey for uh, joining us on the, the, uh, the show today. Uh, this in think tank for the, the COVID-19 virus. So uh, we'd love everyone out there to stay safe and um, don't panic. I love what Jeffrey said. Don't panic. That's the most important thing. So, so thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That was fun. Nice to, yeah. nice to be with everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Sincerely, just from the heart. It was, it was great. Yeah. And, uh, and thanks for yeah. jumping in when my uh, battery went flat and I was trying to figure out what to do. I was like, I was. I didn't even <laughs> notice. That was pretty smooth, guys. You guys must be in radio or something. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, it's time to let Eric's you go to bed, and Janice. Julie. Oh my God! Now, I, now you've got me up. I mean, holy crap! Now I'm going to have to like wind <laughs> down. You know, it's oh, so yeah, funny yeah. talking because uh, because my thing today was with with them closing. I, I have a car that's coming off lease, and because I live now in 
downtown Toronto and I either fly or I drive, you know, walk to work. It's like, ah, it, you know, it's like, so we've been scrambling to get this lease back and calling in favors from all kinds of people to send it back. So I don't have to worry about whether I'm allowed to drive anywhere because I won't have a car <laughs> as of tomorrow. But anyway, that's, that's my job tomorrow. Nobody, nothing else is getting done. But um, guys, thanks so much for pulling this together. I just love what you're doing with this podcast. And I, I, I like your spirit and I like your energy and really feel privileged to have been part of this. And Thank you. now I have some new friends out there. Oh, yeah, yes. absolutely. When life comes back to normal, you know where to come. Yes. Oh, Christ. I don't know if it's ever going to be normal. Let that go. <laughs> oh, Let that go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Up, upside down is the new normal. We all got to yes. get really good at that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. You guys should recognize that you've got a potential new industry over there which is your government if you'd like to oh yes <laughs> who 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 in canada no in new zealand in new zealand tell us what happened well no i have to say that um i think jacinda ardern is being the absolute role model for there's a couple of there was actually a post um about a couple of other there was a norwegian president is is uh female and there's another one floating around i can't remember where she is the danish or Danish, Finnish. i think she might be also yeah, yeah. up that way but the bottom line is that the women are showing the eq quite frankly and yeah who would have thought empathy could lead the way hey? oh. <laughs> and that's exciting <laughs> yeah well i'm sorry we've been leading it the other way and it hasn't worked so well <laughs> yeah yeah like, yeah. All right, guys. Thank um, you all anyway. very, very much. Have a sensational rest of day and sleep well, Janet.